Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at BetterHelp.com slash Nerdery and Murdery. That's BetterHelp.com forward slash Nerdery and Murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. I plied Jeffrey with liquor and I finally know what you two scumbags did to the Star Wars machine. Welcome to episode 39 of Nerdery and Murdery. A Trente y Nueve. God, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm Zig with your Nerdery. I'm Jeffrey with your Murdery, and this episode comes out on February 27th. Uh, I did want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring our show. Uh, I have been using them myself, and it's it's pretty cool to be able to have access to a therapist pretty much on demand. Yeah. I yeah. send messages, and my therapist uh, messages me back, and has questions for me, things she you know wants me to talk about and whatnot. So I've enjoyed them. I really have. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm 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 cracking that out here pretty soon myself. So there's some things I need to talk about. Sure. So listeners out there, please do uh, try that. As you heard in the ad at the front, uh, you can get ten percent off uh, by going to BetterHelp.com forward slash Nerdery and Murdery. So do check that out. I highly recommend it. I also wanted to give a selfless plug to please remember to rate and review us on iTunes. It's something free that you can do, and it really, really helps us. We've got uh, quite a few reviews uh, out there already and uh, and ratings, so please do that. We, we, we very, very much appreciate it. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. Uh, I had a couple of things that I was going to tell you about. Uh, finally got my steroid shot in my knee, so... Ouch! No, it's so much better. Oh, my God. I, I was to the point. I mean, you know, what's your pain level between a 1 and a 10? Um, 10. 10 every day. 5,006. Yeah. Um, now, with the with the steroid shot and this topical stuff that they gave me, it's mm-hmm. down to like a 2. 
Oh, every nice. Day. It's, it's nice. And my gosh, it's a game changer. So good thing about that. Um, two other things I wanted to tell you about. Two eateries. Uh-huh. So the first one we ate at last night. And okay. this was called DeLuca's. DeLuca's? Right. Okay. So you know Texas Day Brazil. You've got mm-hmm. the gauchos that come around and they slice you off some meat. Yeah. And, and, and you know, they just all, they keep coming and coming and coming until you say, stop, I can't eat anymore. DeLuca's is that concept with gourmet pizza. And you start off with a cup of lobster bisque, which was delicious, and an arugula, arugula salad with a real light vinaigrette type dressing. What's arugula? What's arugula? It's a vegetable. I knew you'd appreciate that one. <laughs> I um, love my blue heaven. But I mean, there was like their their pepperoni pizza. It was like prime cut pepperoni, beautiful pepperoni. They had this um, Mexican elote pizza with corn and a uh, um, kind of a chipotle sauce on uh-huh. it, huh? Or aioli maybe. Yeah. Well, elote uh, usually has like a mayonnaise with a yeah. Chili oh, powder. so good. Oh. They had a barbecue. They had a lamb. They had a. Um, a margarita pizza, which which was pretty good. Uh, a, a four cheese. Um, I, I can't I can't even remember all of them. What, but they where, just where is this place? South Lake, Fort Worth, and I think a couple places in Dallas. Nice. And yeah, they just keep coming and coming and coming with the food once it starts. And dude, man, you need to make a reservation because they fill up quick. I'll bet. Very very quick. So that was Delucas. The other one. Uh huh that I really think we'll probably be ending up eating for lunch today is RG Burger in Denton. So as we talked about that Coral City Burger on the show before, they've got that nice, sweet sourdough bun. And it's and it's the burger itself is like a backyard burger. It's so good and so filling. Uh, we ate there, and and I, I figured as soon as I mentioned it, we're probably going to have to eat at RG Burger today. Woo-hoo. So. <laughs> that's the things I had, you know, had to talk about, had to talk about my knee and some food. So nice. that, that's, that's all I had for today. How uh, about you? I, uh, n- uh, not a lot going on. Um, I did take uh, Ella and Lorelai to a little school carnival yesterday. We had a lot of fun with that. It's kind of chilly, but uh, the kids had fun. And sure. We went and grabbed some cocoa. And Yeah, it's cold here in Texas, people. It is indeedy. <laughs> I think when I woke up this morning, it, the feels like temperature was 22. Nice. So nice and cold and had the fire going on out uh, out on the patio this morning. So yes. love the cold weather. That was much appreciated, sir. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Just hope we don't have snowmageddon like last year. No, did, we we no. could be cold, just not that. Uh, not that again. The kids didn't even get to enjoy it. It was no. too cold for them to play in the snow. Oh, God, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. And I just, I just don't want those power outages and whatnot. So hopefully... Hopefully we'll have a little bit better winter. I don't, like I said, don't mind the cold. Yes. Knock on wood. wood. So cool. Anything else before we kick into the nerdery side of the house today? Uh, no, no, nothing. I was actually kind of excited about today's nerdery. Uh, took a poll. Take it on. Well, awesome. I took a poll, uh, between myself and Jeffrey. Um, it was our top 10 favorite coin up game. Outstanding. Uh, we had, I believe, four or five crossovers. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and we will talk about this uh, as we get to them. And, so. and, and as you're talking about them, because I, I can't remember your list, are we talking about mainly 80s or just any... Any coin-operated game. Okay. Any coin... Because uh, I, I know a lot of them were in the 80s, but there were some that were in the 90s and... Well, 80s was reason. the heyday yeah. for the coin-ops. Oh, yeah. You know, that because we've talked about in previous episodes, you had the... The arcades and malls. You had video games at Seven Eleven. I mean, many convenience stores had a small video game section in them. Everywhere you went, yeah. One of our patrons asked specifically: there were arc- <laughs> there were small arcades at Seven Elevens. Yes, and I sent that particular patron a picture. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And it was just it, it, our, arcades were great. They were dark, dank dungeons, oh. and you know you had the guy who who worked in there, the the basically the stoner who worked in yeah. there, walking around cleaning off everything, making yeah. sure everything was working. Yeah. But they were they were places we we hung out, oh. and you could hang out there without money and just watch people play. Yeah. Similar like kids, they'll now watch. They'll watch other people play video games on YouTube. I've watched my yeah. nephews watch people play Minecraft. Yeah. And it was similar back then that we could walk into an arcade and just watch somebody that was really, really good at a oh, game. Oh, especially like, uh, I was never any good at Dragon's Lair. Neither was I. But if you knew somebody who knew how to do it, 
who you know, watch them do it, it played out like a movie. Sure. And it was amazing. Sure. You I said, was not one of those guys. No, and and you just you just had to be able to remember the patterns throughout everything yes. because it was the same every time. Yeah. So you just kind of went through it and they had the various levels and whatnot. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. That's that's actually the minutiae we wanted to get into today. This one may go a little long because we, we did uh poll and we we got twenty games. I think there's a total of fifteen between the two of us. Uh I did want to start with honorable mention. Um uh, that was given to me by uh, my middle child who now wants to be called Kim the third. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have run away from that name my entire life as has my dad. I, I call my dad up. I'm like, um, Chloe wants to be called Kim. Now he's like, why? <laughs> hey, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's so by Kim the third, uh, uh, Cubert uh, because of the alien cursing. Right. That's really funny. Um, Cubert is a hard game. I never could figure out the. I, was, I don't think I have the depth perception to do it right. I was pretty decent at Cubert. Uh, that was a favorite of mine, and yeah, it was always funny as a kid because <laughs> right, he swore, at, you know, with the with the symbols uh, mm-hmm. above his head. But uh, but yeah, I was I was pretty decent at Cubert. It was a it was a fun game, nice little kind of a three D ish yeah. game for the time. Yes, yeah, really, really, <clears throat> and really nice and innovative. Uh, secondly was the Tetris cabinet cabinet because of the dancing, uh, because you didn't get that in the home game. Mm -hmm. Well, you do now, but back in the day, the only way to get the little, the little Russian guys to dance was to play it on on a cabinet. Uh, and, and thirdly, and finally the duck hunt cabinet, (laughs) because in the cabinet or arcade version, you can shoot the dog. I hated that dog. (laughs) I mean, that's really terrible that it allows you to shoot a dog. I, I mean, let's be honest about yes. it. Yeah, well, the dog doesn't die. It just gets, you know, kind of a, a big black smudge on its face. Yes. And makes a crazy little... But I did hate that the dog would snicker and laugh at you if you mm-hmm. if you didn't get the ducks. But, uh, but yeah, it's really... I mean, let's be honest. It's very terrible that you're shooting a you're dog. Shooting a dog. Yeah. Even though it's laughing at you. Right. <clears throat> well, it's not a real dog, so... So, for my list, my top game is... Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix is a fixed shooter arcade game released in December of 1980, developed in Japan by either Hirokoa or TPN. They're not sure who developed it, but they do know that it was released by Taito in December of 1980. It was then released in Europe and then America by Centauri and Amstar Electronics in January of 1981. Uh, The Phoenix Mothership is one of the first video arcade game bosses uh, ever. So... How it plays out, um, the player controls a spaceship that moves horizontally at the bottom of the screen, much like Galaga or Galaxian. Um, the player ship shooting, and it periodically, uh, things will dive towards the ship uh, in an attempt to crash it. Uh, the ship is equipped with shields that can be used to zap any of the alien creatures that attempt to crash into it, but you cannot move while the shield is in place. I don't think you can fire either. I don't know if that... I, it's been a while since I've played it. So the player starts with three or six lives. There was a setting on the machine. There was a pizza place over on Jacksboro Highway. I think it's Boss's Pizza now, but it used to be a pizza inn, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure from the design it was a pizza hut. Was it a pizza hut? I'm almost positive of that. They had a Phoenix that had the six lives set to it. And I could play that thing for an hour and a half. You know, I I would have to get on one quarter. Hey, come over here and eat some pizza and then you can go back to playing. Um, The life is lost whenever a ship is hit uh, by the enemy projectiles when the shield is down. Each level has five separate rounds. Uh, Round one and two, the player must destroy a formation of alien birds, much like, you know, Gallagher, Galaxian. Uh, Some of the birds do do a kamikaze dive in much the same way. Um, round three and four, you've got these flying eggs. They float on the screen and after a few seconds, they hatch revealing larger alien birds resembling the phoenixes, which is where it gets the name. Uh, they will swoop down and try to hit your ship as well as drop other things on it. Um, the bird-like creatures are blue in round three and pink in round four. Round five, the player is pitted against the mothership. Now this is the big bit 
in Phoenix that's crazy. And uh, if you ever get a chance to play, I'm going to give you a little secret. Shoot all of the birds but one. Because when you shoot all of the birds that are flying around this giant mothership, they respawn. But if you leave one, all you have to do is worry about one. So you've got this giant mothership, which looks a lot like... It looks like the Comet Empire's um, mothership in the second season of Star Blazers. So, kind of get nerdy on that. You guys may have to look that up. But so basically, it's a it's a city um, over a, a band of things that fire, and then a giant meteor half moon underneath it. You have to shoot up through the meteor. You have to shoot past the bands that fire, and in the middle there is a a, a giant one-eyed alien creature that you have to hit. And once you do that, it destroys the mothership and you've defeated the boss and you start again at the beginning. I, I'm just, as you're, as you're describing Phoenix, I'm having a hard time remembering this one specifically because I'm thinking about two different games, um, Galaga, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to pronounce it right. Ple Ple Pleiades, Pleiades, it's a, it's a, Pleiades. Pleiades? I think so. I'm thinking about those two <laughs> We're not two grammatists. Games. Right. No, we are not grammatists. Those are the two games I'm thinking about. And yes. I think Phoenix is kind of in the in, middle between, in between those them. two. Yes. Okay. Um, I, and again, I realize it, it wasn't... It was a pretty successful game, but it wasn't anywhere near Galaga or Pleiades or Space Invaders. Sure. But this one really captured my imagination with the Mothership. I just loved it. And I love the fact that it looked like the Mothership from the Comet Empire. In, in Star Blazers or, you know, Space Battleship Yamato for the purists. <clears throat> but it was it was a lot of fun to play. And if it had the six lives, I could play forever. Um, I was fairly good at this game. And I've played this game again. I'm still fairly good at this game. Um, I'm better at it than I am at Galaga. Where did you see it recently? Uh, I want to say it was at Tornado Terry's. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I want to say in one of those multi-cade machines, there was a Phoenix in there and I played it and I got up to the mothership. And then once I killed the mothership, I was done. I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'll go play something else. So yeah, another <laughs> shameless promotion for Tornado Terry's. If you're in the Metroplex area, go up to Tornado Terry's and check it out. They've got a lot of these things are there. My second game is Starblade. This is one that we had a crossover on. Uh, Starblade is a 1991 3D rail shooter arcade game developed and published by Namco. Uh, in my notes, it says you're controlling the Starfighter FX-01 Geo no. Sword. You are not. You're the gunner. You are just a gunner. Yep. That's all you have to do is what the, the ship is programmed to fly where it needs to program, and you just have to shoot things down before they hit you. The ship itself is on rails. Yes. And, and yeah, it's, it, it's doing all the maneuvering for you. You have to just shoot. Um, the, 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 the yeah, and, and, and as much stuff as they throw at you, it's enough. Right. <laughs> and it's the, it's the, it's the fighter geo sword. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about Starblade, and I'm sorry, it may be in your notes, or I'm sure it is, but the thing I loved about Starblade is it's the last Starfighter. Yeah, it is the it last is. Starfighter. Uh, yeah. Because you're the gunner, somebody else is piloting the thing. Yep. Because I think you even have some sort of death blossom. Yes, that, that there is a to, death blossom. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's 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 wholeheartedly the last yeah. Starfighter. Yeah, well, that's the first time I played it. I was like, oh my God, this is the last Starfighter. Because yes. they, they never really developed that game. No, and but they're rebooting the movie. Oh, I hope they release an arcade. Well, they probably won't release an arcade game. They might on the PC or the con yeah. or console, though. Yeah. yeah, basically in the gameplay, you, you're controlling crosshairs on a flight yoke stick. And you just shoot stuff down. Yep. Um, and it is a first-person perspective shooter, and it's 3D. It is the only 3D game that I like. Honestly, 3D games hurt my eyes. I, and it may be because of dyslexia. I don't know. But they bother me. They, they give me headaches. Every there's moment. a lot of people that have that problem, yeah. too. Um, so your, your mission in the game is to destroy the U... The UIMS, Unknown Intelligent Mechanized Species, <laughs> uh, before they destroy the Earth. The Geo Short uh, has a shield meter at the bottom left corner, which will deplete when it inflicted with enemy fire. And when the meter is fully drained, the game ends. Uh, the player will need to complete two missions, destroying the pow powerful reactor or superweapon, Red Eye, and eliminating uh, an enemy fortress and powerful ship named the Commander. 
Uh, the commander stalks the player throughout the game with a flight against it, assuming both missions are completed. Now, you, you think, well, it's a, you know, you're shooting fighters. No, no. You, you have to go up uh, and hit fighters, and then you have to go up and hit destroyers, and then you have to go up and hit battleships, and then you mm-hmm. have to go up. And they're throwing things at you the entire time. Well, and if you're interested, um, I this this being on 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 both of our lists um i found a video on youtube that goes from start to finish yes and that was just fascinating to yeah watch. oh you know what i don't think i need to upload that to the notes so people can see sure because it. it's amazing how much yeah. stuff they throw at you yeah and it's a beautiful game and i love the um the uh, the voice in the game is it's going along telling you you know the things you need to do next or what's coming yes I just, yeah the, the 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 game itself was just I'm I, the only the only one of these I've ever seen was at Pizza Hut mm-hmm. over off Lackland Road in uh-huh. Fort Worth. That's the only one I've ever seen, and I've never seen it since. Yeah, the Pizza Hut off Lackland Road. What's really funny? They also had one at the Putt Putt. Putt no, yeah. Putt Putt, not Pizza Hut. I'm sorry. I said if I said Pizza Hut, I meant okay. Putt Putt. I was like, oh wow. Oh, well, I think they may have had one. I think they may have had one at Ridgemar Mall in the Starport, but mm. they didn't have it. For very long, so okay, because it was like, oh wow, Starblade again, right? Yeah, and and, and what was great is that I think it was just a single quarter, but you had to keep feeding it if you wanted to keep. Playing. Oh yeah, and yeah. It, it it was a it was a quarter eater for yeah, sure. A couple of the games on my list are, but that's I think that's why I like them because I could just keep playing them. The next one is Road Blasters. Boom. I don't have any problem finding that game. No. You find Road Blasters any, anywhere. Any arcade, old style arcade that is out, there, I guarantee there's a Road They either have a stand up or a sit down. Yes. Um, the sit down was my favorite um, just because it was so immersive. I, again, even in high school, I would go over to the, well, it was originally a showbiz and then became a Chunky e. Cheese. Chunky e. Cheese. Chunky e. Cheese. Yes, I know. I, I know it's Chuck E. Cheese, but we called it Chunky e. Cheese. Hope they don't want to sponsor us. Uh, Chuck E. Cheese. If you want to sponsor us, it's okay. You know, if you, if you want to sponsor us, we're so sorry for saying Chunky e. Cheese. Chunky e. Cheese. <laughs> I had a teacher. That's what she called it. <laughs> we all did. Chunky e. Cheese. Um, so this one was released by Atari in 1987. This is one of the. They were still doing arcade games, and they were still doing arcade games really, really well at this period. Um, Road Blasters. The player must navigate an armed sports car. Through fifty different race ra- uh, rally races, uh, getting to the finish line before running out of fuel. Now you could pick up extra fuel in the form of little green balls, um, or red. I thought what, the were, red there, there's was, green. Yeah. What did red do? I thought red was for like shields, maybe. I don't remember, but you could pick up red too. Yes, a helicopter occasionally will fly overhead and drops a power item. Um. Like the nuke or the the rockets, uh, there are fifty different rallies, and of course you've got the cannon on the front. Uh, and a, you had the cannon, yeah, the turbojet, yeah, and the nuke, and the nuke, yep. And there are also uh, roadside gun turrets that you can hit for extra points, but they will they'll blast you if you're not careful. Well, and you can blast everything in front of you except yeah. for the armored vehicles that yes. you can't hit. No, I think you can hit them with the nuke. Yeah, the nu- yeah, yeah, the nuke will take them out. Yeah, nuke takes everything in front of you out for for quite yeah. a distance. Now you do get scoring multipliers at <clears throat> uh, at the start of each rally. Each time the player f- successfully strikes a target, the multiplier increases by one, up to a maximum of a multiplier of ten. But once you miss, the multiplier goes back down to zero. <laughs> uh, a helicopter occasionally flies overhead and drops the power items. Uh, the player also encounters indestructible obstacles uh, consisting of mines. I forgot about those boulders, floating spiker balls, and oil slicks. And uh, the oil slick will cause your car to spin out of control. Uh, you've got the main fuel tank and a small reserve tank. The main tank runs out at any one time the car begins to use its reserve. Red, oh, I, think, I think that's what the red does. Yeah, the red, red is the reserve. Inter- yeah, destroyed from a distance. Uh, green appears at specific mileage. Yeah. So that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, reaching the halfway point of rally resets the main tank to level the level it had at the start of the stage, but it does not affect the reserve. That's right. Yeah. At the end of the rally, the main tank is refilled and fuel is added to the reserve based on the number of points scored. So, well, and the higher the level you are, the faster the fuel goes out, yes. which is annoying because yes. I, I could, I could never get very far in this game. No, I always start at level one and just see how far I can go. Right. I do pretty good, but 
after a while, it's uh, after a while, it's kind of tough. And you can do a continue on all but the last rally. Mm. You cannot do a continue on the fiftieth rally. Uh, you only get one chance to play the fiftieth and final. And the, completing this rally awards a bonus of one million points at the end of the game. I have never seen anybody complete this game. I think it's just it's in the classic Atari style of you play as long as you can. You're, you're basically playing against the machine. You know, like a pinball game. You don't really ever win a pinball game. You can get it to give you a free game, and that's basically what people use as a goal. Uh, my next game is Gauntlet 2. And the reason I picked Gauntlet 2 is because I liked it better than Gauntlet 1. Sure. Well, Gauntlet <clears throat> Gauntlet 2 allowed you to pick the character yes. instead of being forced, depending on what side of the machine you were on. Gauntlet and Gauntlet 2 are coin eaters. Oh, yeah. Because you can't just play, you can't just play if you're really good until you die. Yeah. It, your, your life is constantly going down. Uh-huh. So, and, and when you pump another quarter in, you get more of your life. That's right. That's annoying. I love the game, but that's wizard annoying. Wizard is about to die. Green wizard is about to die. Valkyrie is about to die. <laughs> yes, the game talks to you as well. Uh, now, uh... It serves as an immediate sequel to the original Gauntlet. Uh, it was released that was released in 1985. Gauntlet Two was released in '86. Uh, Gauntlet Two's fantasy themed top down dungeon crawler game and was released uh, with a dedicated cabinet. Now, I have only ever seen the four player cabinets. I understand they also released two player cabinets. Never seen that. Yeah, me either. Every every one I've ever seen was the four player cabinets. Yeah, same with me. There are four character classes to play. Uh, your choices being warrior, Valkyrie, wizard, and elf. If you want to beat this game, you need to have four people in a lot of quarters. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you've got the warrior who, that's your tank, goes uh-huh. and, ju- and can fight melee. Yep. Uh, the Valkyrie and the elf are are really good shooters. Yeah, range combat. And the Valkyrie has some brute yeah. skills and so can go up with the fighter. And then the mage is stand back. And yeah, stand back and blast. Fight through murder holes and <laughs> different things like that. Yeah. And, yeah, and again, the best thing about Gauntlet 2 is you can choose the players. You can even choose the same player and they're just at slightly different color palettes of 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 green um red and blue being in all versions of the game uh while yellow and green are featured in in the four player versions um uh, and they entered uh, in gauntlet 2 the voiceover identifies them as if you've got like two elves you've got a yellow elf and a green elf it identifies yellow elf is about to die right whereas if you're everybody's playing a different character class it just says valkyrie or uh, now, they did add some new level designs, including the possibility of encountering them in altered ways by having the play field turned in step 90 degrees. Uh, there is an enemy it, which upon contact makes a player it and drew all of the enemies towards them. I'd forgotten about that yeah, one. Me too. When I was reading that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That sucked. Because <laughs> then you, the only way to get it off of you is to touch one of your other right. players. <laughs> Warrior is now it. Yeah. Oh, God, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Or, you know, exiting the thing. If you got it toward the end, that was fine. Uh, and, you know, there were... there were The cool thing about Gauntlet is you had different types of monsters, like ghosts, and they all had little generating points, or uh, spawning points. Mm-hmm. And each one was different, like the, the, the little troll guys were, would come out of these little funky looking houses and the ghosts came out of little piles of bones and you not only could you destroy the ghosts and the the trolls and things like that you could also destroy their houses but it took a lot of hits so you had to put your brute up front and have your your uh your shooters behind them preferably or, in a hallway right or have a shooter find a murder hole that, yeah, that, that, that just, has a line of sight to just, the generator yeah just keep hitting that generator until it drops uh, new level elements we're also adding. Uh, these include all walls or invisible element. That one sucked because it's just a big old, it looks like it's a big old empty room, and but there are walls. You just can't see them. Mm-hmm. Um, magic walls, which changed into monsters or items when you hit it. Stun tiles. And fake exits. You remember that? I do remember that. Yes. Yep. And then we also had, uh, as a creature, uh, the death. Yes. That, that little black one that was just insanely hard to kill. Yeah. Or could you, could you kill it? 
I think you could kill it, but you had to hit it a lot. Yeah. There are also secret rooms. And oh, yeah. And when you went to the fake exit, it would go, don't be fooled. And you got treasure and food yeah. along the way. That was the only thing that would help you from your, your life going down yes. and down and down was to get food. Yeah, food. I think there was wine yes. and food. and But you didn't get that much of it. And higher up in the levels, you never got any. No. There'd be like one in the whole level. So that is basically it for Gauntlet 2. Um, if you're going to play that one, kids, bring a lot of quarters and bring your friends because oh, you have gosh, to play yes. four people. Uh, my next game is Galaga. Galaga is a 1981 fixed shooter arcade game developed and published by Namco. Uh, it was released by Midway Manufacturing in North America, and it is a sequel to Galaxian. Now, I always remember Galaga first. I never remember Galaxian. I have played Galaxian. I don't think it's as good as Galaga. I understand why that was such a hit. And this was Namco's first major hit. Um, you control a starship. The player's task was destroying the Galaga forces in each stage while avoiding enemies and projectiles. Now, again, a little super secret thing. On the first level in Galaga, if you can allow one B to survive till the end, you have to let it circle. You have to be over all on the far left of the screen and not get hit by this thing. Eventually, it would give you extra lives. I remember that. Yeah, and once you got the extra lives, you shot the B and went on to the next, the next, uh, the next level. Uh, Galaga also had challenging stages that if you could, if you could hit everything in the challenging stages, you would get extra lives and your score would go through the roof. Uh, but you had to hit everything, and it's hard. It's hard because they come down through the middle and then they turn, and some of them you have to hit twice. Galaga also had the uh, the ships that would capture your ship. And if you hit, you had to hit them twice. If you hit them in just the right way, you would get an extra ship to drop your ship to drop back, and you would have double firing. The only problem is it cost you one of your lives. So if you could get an extra life, you could keep those two double ships firing, and it was it was amazing. So here's another reason we've got to go to original pinballs in Austin. How tall would you say that wall is there to your left? I don't know, 12, 15 feet. They have a Galaga that's that big. <laughs> the, screen is, the screen is literally as big as that wall. Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, because that's probably a twelve by twelve wall. Nice. Yeah. Then that's that's they have a screen, a Galaga screen that is that big. There. Nice. Watch watch Barbara play it. Oh, nice. Uh, atop the enemy formations of the four large aliens known as the Boss Galagas. Those are the ones that pick up your ships. Also, I believe that one B will turn into three. One of the bees will turn into three different... Uh, three little stinger. I call I called them stingers because yeah. they look like little scorpions. Yeah, little wings. scorpions. Yeah. And if you hit all those, I gave you extra points as well. Now, some enemies... Oh, yeah. Galaxian flagship. Stages are indicated by emblems located at the bottom right of the screen. Um, enemies become more aggressive as the game progresses. And they get a lot faster. Uh, Galaga is one of those games... You can beat Galaga, I believe. I've heard that there is a kill screen in Galaga. I've never seen it. I don't know anybody who has ever seen it. Uh, I've never seen it, but I mean, now I have to look it up on YouTube. Yes, yes. I'm sure somebody has. Yes, well, yeah. I mean, but, I mean, honestly, after... When I was young, I was pretty good. I could get up to stage 15, 16 pretty easily on just one quarter. But I was playing it every weekend at the skating rink. So, yeah, that's about it for Galaga other than get out there and play it. And, yeah, if you could play a 15-foot version of it, I'd say go play that as well. What was the name of that place again? Original Pinballs. Original Pinballs. With which, a Z. With a Z. Yeah, we need to go down to Austin because I think everything on our list is there. Yes. Uh, my next game is Golden T99, the Rancho Saguaro course. <laughs> The Golden Tee series began as a project by Incredible Technologies to create a large-scale golf simulator for sizable family entertainment centers. Now, let me start by saying this. I do not like sports. I am not a sports guy. I spent my time studying things like Star Trek, as you can tell, and Doctor Who, as opposed to box scores. Having said that, this is one of my favorite games to play. Love Golden Tee. There's a giant rollerball that you can, you can really, really just... Hammer on. Sometimes you got to go and take a run and dive at it 
Yeah, and sometimes if you're a fucking idiot like me, you take a run and dive at it, and instead of hitting on the top of the trackball to actually hit it, you slam your fist into the front of the machine and wind up at the emergency room because you fractured your wrist. I still think you should have told them you injured that playing golf, not playing a video game. Oh, yeah. When I told the people at the ER that I've injured it playing a video game, they laughed at me and said, you need to stop playing video games because you're not good at it. <laughs> wow. Oh, which is actually untrue. He's actually really good at Golden Tee. Um, we was. Used, yeah, we used to play this a lot. Now, the reason I like the Rancho Saguaro one the best is because I had that course dialed in. There are a couple of uh, there are a couple of courses there that I could either I could either uh, hole in one or eagle every time I played them. Well, and the 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 one of the one of my favorite memories is when uh, you and I and Don. <clears throat> all worked in a bar that no longer exists, at least not in Fort Worth anyway, right? Sharky's. And they had Sharky's a nachos. Tea. Yeah. It, well, we always played golden tea before we had to start our night shift. Yep. And it, it, it was just great. And then when I went up there to watch football on Sundays, we were always playing golden, golden tea. tea. I mean, yeah. that thing, that thing made that bar some money. Yes, it did. It was a great, great game. Yeah. We played and played and played and played and played. Yeah. It's a, it takes a lot of quarters to play the whole course, especially with a lot of people, but it was a couple of, you yeah, uh, back then, I think, I think it was about three bucks a person to play all 18 holes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, but, Good God, if there was three or four of us playing, that was a, what, an hour and a half? Mm, maybe. That's I, I don't not... know if it was that long, but yeah. we so, we usually play several rounds of that in in a, in a Sunday as we're as yeah. we're as we were watching football. We you know, we'd play at halftime, everything like that. that. That was just a super super fun game. Yeah. Um what was really weird, I did not know this until I looked it up. Uh, they wanted to create this virtual golf course, uh, but they, the, 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 the thing fell through. So Hodgson, uh, Larry Hodgson retooled the concept to develop a golf game for a regular arcade cabinet. And he worked with co-designer Jim Zielinski and they initially rendered this using deluxe paint. And if you look at the, the original game, it's like, oh yeah, I could see how they did that in deluxe paint because of the color palette. Uh, and of course they wanted to, they didn't want to use buttons and and joysticks they wanted to use that rollerball because what was great about that rollerball is you could really dial in just how you wanted that ball to turn and move and you got it set up just so and then rolled it flicked it um it was so sensitive that it would it would it would rate your putts you know by pounds per square inch uh and it was Oh God, it was so beautiful. Um, now they used uh, it was similar to Capcom Bowling in the, the the same sort of control feature, and there were buttons, but it was to move you for to the left or the right of the ball. You know, it was your uh, and stance. There was a backspin button. Yeah, too. and yeah, that's right, and a backspin. Um, the machines were made by Incredible Technologies during the time period of Golden T ninety nine and Golden T ninety nine Tournament Edition, and again. If you guys get a chance to play Golden Tee, all of them are great. The Rancho Saguaro one is probably the prettiest because it's it goes through a desert setting um, with these beautiful saguaro cactuses that you can shoot a ball through, which is probably my favorite part. If yeah, I, I love the secret paths that uh -huh. some of the courses had, um, you know, to, 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 to get to the green <clears throat> in one shot on on an eagle putt or on an eagle shot mm -hmm. uh, excuse me on a five par you could get to the green if you if there was one of those secret paths that's right and you had to be dead eye spot on it had to be perfect because there was trees in the way and whatnot and if you didn't hit it just right mm -hmm. you were hosed oh yeah and, and that i'm thinking of one in the ranch of saguaro i can't remember what what hole it was on but it was great. You could you could really really get up really really well in that game on and I want to say it was like a whole 5 or 6. But if you missed, you'd oh, yeah. be dead last. Oh yeah, cuz I I I I'm I know one of the ones I'm thinking of and it could be the same one you're thinking of. If you played <clears throat> without the little secret path, 
there was this huge dog leg yep. that you had to go around. And it was going to take you a minimum of two shots to get around mm-hmm. that dog leg. And so then you're taking your third shot so that by the time you get to the green, the best you're hoping for is a birdie. Mm-hmm. But there was a path yep. off to the left that was lined with trees, mm-hmm. and you had to have the right curve, mm-hmm. the right the right strength on the ball to just beat a line yep. right through there. And it would either put you on the green or one hit from the green yeah. so you can go for an eagle putt. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and there was a water hazard there, too, the one I'm thinking of. You had to actually put it through the arm of a saguaro cactus. And hit it just right. And if you hit that saguaro cactus, you were going in the water. My next game is one we've discussed before. I would like to refer to this as the bane of my 21-year-old existence. Dracula Pinball. Yes. Bram Stoker's Dracula Pinball. Uh, It was released by Williams. Uh, It's based on the 1992 film. Um, The game was characterized by its unusual blood-red DMD display. Uh, Most other games at the time used orange uh, for their colors. And as well as its multi-ball mode, where there are up to three different multi-ball variations, which could be active at the same time. So, as I said before, you can get five or six multi-balls playing at the same time, and your score would just rack up. Well, and that wasn't... Five balls... Uh, Five-ball multi-ball wasn't that unusual, because other pinball games yeah. had it. But but as we talked about in in a previous episode... The 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 problem with all the multi ball in Dracula is that fucking magnet. <laughs> we hate it. Um, we hate that magnet so much because they're just taking drain balls. Yep. Um. So with each successive active mode provided a jack jackpot multiplier of up to three times your 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 score. It also featured a unique variation of the unusual multi-ball mode known as the Mist Multi-Ball, where a magnet would drag a pinball across the play field. The Mist Mode. Um, and it required to, to knock it loose with another ball sometimes. But the magnet was on, so when your ball got to it, you were in trouble. The game was characterized by... Uh, it was really hard to get that loose from the magnet's grip at the start of the mode, so... You had to be careful. My next video game is Seawolf. 1976 Seawolf. And I will say this now. That was the dirtiest thing to put your head on in the world. Oh, God. Yeah. That, Battlezone. Mm-hmm. Um, there's at least one other that I'm thinking of where you had to put your head into, you know, onto a set of goggles. That, yeah. God, thinking about that now, that was nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. All this. Nobody z- cleaned it. No. Nobody disinfected Ever. it. You would, you would see some, some sweaty, pimply headed, k- greasy kid step <laughs> off and you're going to step right on it. <laughs> put yourself right on that thing. Oh, I can't it's tell gross. you how many times I put my head up there and it wasn't dry. <laughs> I can't believe this is the first time that I'm actually thinking about how gross it is to step up it to those like machines. sweat and zit cream. Oh my god! Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. okay. All right. Continue. Okay, so oh. this was a video game updated of an earlier coin-operated op- electromechanical device, uh, Sea Devil. Uh, which was based on Sega's 1966 coin-op electromechanical arcade submarine simulator called Periscope. So what it is, what we're talking about, is there's actually a periscope you put your head into that you can look through and turn for Mm Seawolf. But instead of it being electromechanical, where you're looking at basically a scrolling mat, you're actually looking at a video game. I thought of the third one, Battlezone 2000. Battlezone 2000. Not not Battlezone, uh, uh... Beachhead 2000. Yes. That was the other one you looked through a, a, a goggle periscope yeah, type little thing. Little scopes. Um, the game was released in Japan by Taito. Seawolf was designed by Dave Nutting. Uh, and the game sold 10,000 arcade cabinets, was the highest grossing arcade video game of 76 and 77 in the United States and Japan's fifth highest grossing arcade video game of 1976. Nutting was originally. Uh, who Atari was partnered with when they released um, 
Space War was with Nutting and Associates. Um, and again, as we said, you looked through a large periscope to aim at ships moving across a virtual sea line at the top of the screen. Use a thumb button on the right handle of the scope to fire torpedoes. The periscope swiveled to the right and the left, providing horizontal motion for targeting the crosshairs. The cabinet featured a mixture of video game and older electromechanical technologies for player feedback. Uh, you did have backlit transparencies reflecting inside the scope. Uh, a number of torpedoes remains are displayed as well as a red reload light, which lights up momentarily when the player launches five torpedoes. Additionally, when a ship is hit, a corresponding explosion light is reflected on the screen image uh, and in the ship's approximate position. Now, there was a blue overlay uh, on the screen to provide a watercolor, and the sounds included a sonar ping and a whoosh of launch torpedoes, which was my favorite. There was a ping going on, and when your head was down in that periscope, all you could hear was that ping noise. Ping. Uh, sea Wolf is a time limit, uh, with the player having an opportunity to win bonus time by reaching an operator set score. The player score is shown on the bottom half of the screen, as well as a high score. Um, it's the first known instance of high score in a video game. Targets include destroying a fast-moving PT boat, which was hard to hit, and mines floating across this, uh, the screen that serve as obstructions. Now, part of this game was timing. You had to time your hits, especially if they were further out on the screen, because you had to give time for that torpedo to get there. Um, I loved Seawolf. Again, this is one of the ones I never think about, but I remember as a little kid having to stand on a bar stool to play this game, how much I could just play it. And I was never that good at it. <laughs> I'm much better at it now. Yeah, it was the same thing. Uh, I, I, I have the same love for Battlezone, mm -hmm. and and I, I absolutely love that one, but I was never really good at it. And that was another one you had to you had to lead your shots, Yeah, just, just like Seawolf. Yeah, my next one is Star Wars. It's a first-person rail shooter video game designed by Mike Holly and released in arcade in 1983 by Atari. It used 3D color vector graphics to, to simulate the assault on a Death Star from the 1977 film Star Wars, developed during the golden age of arcade games. Now, since you have been plied with liquor, I want to talk about someone I know who has a Star Wars arcade cabinet sure keith's got it yep we i mean i i think we've mentioned that that he has it we've we have played that so many times over the years um it's 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 a great game um it's one of my original favorites and i can mm -hmm. i mean i could just play it and play it and play oh it. my god yeah and it's all vector graphics mm -hmm. but they were done so well oh yeah you know very different so so let's con uh, contrast Starblade and Star Wars. Mm -hmm. In Star Wars, you're controlling the ship as well as the yes. firing. I mean, you've got to be the one to to pilot and and get all the TIE fighters. And it was really cool because they'd fire at you and you could shoot down their fireballs, which was kind of funny because yeah. that's not really how it goes. Yeah. But and they look like snowflakes. They look like snowflakes coming at you. These multicolored snowflakes. Uh, and then you and then you have the. Uh, the, the 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 Death Star surface run with the tower, yes, and then you go down into the trench. The game was great, and oh, yeah. it was so much fun, and it had um, uh, quotes from the movie mm -hmm. and everything. I love Star Wars. Use the Force, that. Luke. Um, I even loved its sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, which was another vector graphics one. That's right. That was with where you were making the AT-AT runs, right? Uh, you make the AT-AT runs, and then you do the asteroid run. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, you know, and then the third in that series was Return of the Jedi, which was became the cartoon. It, yes. The car, instead of the vector graphics, it was now a cartoon. Yes. Um, I, I kind of like this vector graphic design. And again, I did too. Um, we would go over to Keith and play it 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 and play it. And I got to where I was pretty good on the on the beginner version. I would always win. We always we 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 all got around into Star Wars before we'd gain. Yes. Yes, and then we would go. Then we would make sure we got had something to eat, and then we would game. Right. Usually, uh, burritos with way too much spice, or pizzas, yeah. or whatever. Now, the golden age of arcade games. Uh, Star Wars has been included in the list of the greatest video games of all time. Uh, Don't disagree. No, no, I, I'm with you. Uh, you were Red Five. 
uh, and you did control an X-Wing, and it was a first-person perspective. Now, you don't have to destroy all of the TIE Fighters. Um, it you is get bonus a, points if you do that. Yes, there, there is a time limit, but you don't want to get you know shot down in that first run. You want to make it to that tower run, and ultimately the the trench run. Now, the trench run, they would put uh, obstacles uh, in, in each one of those trenches. Now, it was... Not only did you have things firing at you from the side, but they would put these obstacles that you had to go up and over, or sometimes between two of them um, in the later stages of the game. Now, once you blew up the Death Star, it would repeat the process over. You would play as beginner... Was it beginner, intermediate, and expert? I think so. I think there was three, yeah, maybe four. My next game is Tron. Great it's, game. Yes. Uh, it was manufactured and distributed by Bally. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, by Bally Midway. They had combined by this time in 1982. The game consists of four sub-games inspired by the events of Walt Disney Productions' motion picture Tron, released earlier in the summer. Uh, the lead programmer was Bill Adams, and the music programmer was Earl Vickers. Tron was followed by a 1983 sequel, The Discs of Tron, which was not, excess- uh, was not successful. I still liked it, though. I did, too. Now, Discs of Tron was originally supposed to be in the game. They just couldn't – they couldn't put it – they didn't have enough room to put it in all of the subgenres. Like, oh, well, let's do five of these. Well, we can't. We can only well, four. Well, let's see. So you had – the tank battle. The, yeah, battle tanks. The play. The uh, uh, the MCP. The MCP clone. The light cycles. Uh huh. And uh, the spiders. The IO tower. Yes. Yes, you had you got them. You got them in one, sir. <laughs> Yeah, so the IO tower, the player must guide the Tron through a flashing circle in an input-output tower within a set time limit while avoiding or destroying grid bugs. The grid game, bugs. Yes, the game is based on the spiders. Right. <laughs> Everybody yeah. calls spiders. The game is based on the IO tower scene in the film while adding the grid bugs as enemies. They were only briefly mentioned in the movie. But yeah, I think the IO tower was my favorite. That and the light cycles. I love the light cycle. Light cycles was hard. Oh, yeah, it was hard. But if you knew the pattern, mm-hmm. there was a pattern for every single one, which yep. you could win every single light every cycle. Every time. Every time. The first one was a question mark. Yeah, you make a question mark, you were in good shape. Yep. Uh, the MCP cone, the player must break through a rotating shield wall protecting the MCP cone. And this was my favorite. That's I, right. I love the MPC cone. Yeah. And it, because it was brightly colored, mm-hmm. and you would shoot out basically a rainbow. <laughs> And once you finally got to the top, you could go through it. And it's the Tron's final battle with the MCP in the film. It changes the nature of the in- MCP's shield. Uh, in the light cycle, it's players versus AI variant uh, of the snake game. Um, the colors, the friendly and enemy characters are reversed. This is the only sub game in Tron to not use the rotary dial. Everything else uses the rotary dial. You actually use the, I think it was the flight stick on this one. Yeah. That was another thing that they did. They took a, a basically a flight stick in this game, uh, like out of a, a an airplane simulator, you, you made used, it clear plastic and shine lights you, through it. You used the flight stick and the dial on every on every level. The flight stick had your trigger. That's right. And the dial was spinning which direction you're firing. That's at. right. Yeah, so it was used both for yeah. every level. Oh, that's right. And you used it in the battle tanks, too. Yep. Because in the battle tanks, the... Uh, Tron must uh, guide the red battle tank through a maze and destroy all of the opposing blue enemy tanks by mm-hmm. hitting each of them three times. Uh, no, you're blue, they're red. I think, because you're up against the bad guys. That's right, and they're red. Yep. I wonder why they... Okay. My notes are wrong. Sorry. Well, maybe, I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you were in the red and they were blue, but but it would make yeah. sense because all of all of Sark's would, would have been red. But I don't know. We need to find one. Yeah, yeah. In higher difficulty levels, the enemy tanks are replaced by red recognizers and are much faster and attempt to collide with the player instead of shooting at him or her. Uh, this game is not based on any particular scene, but rather based on tank programs, including a clues failed intrusion into the income mainframe uh, and Space Paranoid's game featured at the beginning of the film. That does it for my list. We are on to Jeffrey's list. Jeffrey's first game is Afterburner. So, a- Afterburner was a 
a, a fighter combat game, which I absolutely loved. You're yes. an F-14 Tomcat. Yes. And um, it's – Afterburner and another one that's on my list are very similar mm-hmm. into what you do. Uh, but but Afterburner had both a stand-up and a sit-down. Uh, and, and you're flying, flying an F-14 Tomcat up against MiGs and I think even helicopters at, at, at one point. Um, it's a hard game the higher it goes. Yes. The, the opposing enemy fighters are... The music's are, great. But the music is great. <laughs> it, it came out because of Top Gun. Yes, it did. And so it was your opportunity to go fly an F-14 Tomcat. Yes. Uh, your machine gun had a limited supply of heat-seeking missiles as well. Uh and it used a third-person perspective previously utilized on Sega's earlier games, Space Harrier and OutRun. Space Harrier is exactly what I was thinking Yeah, of. using the Sega export arcade system. Uh, but yeah, the, the cool thing about it was you got to see the whole Tomcat. You didn't just see the nose of it. You yeah, because you're, see the you're whole behind, thing. Right, you're yeah. behind it the whole time. Yeah, Jeffrey's second game is Space Harrier. Exactly. So, like I said, just like Space Harrier and just like Afterburner, this is a game where <clears throat> you're a little guy with a backpack or with a jet pack on. Yep. And, and, and you, a big gun. And a big gun, a huge gun. And you're firing at all these different creatures that are coming at you. It's really very beautiful beautiful yeah. uh, scenery as it goes through. You can, fi- you know, blow down most trees, and but then you've got these tall towers that you can't hit. You've got to go around. And then every single level has a boss at the end. Mm-hmm. So there is an actual end to this game because you go through level after level after level with a boss at the end. And I think it's 50 levels, I think is what it... Yeah, I could be wrong on that. But that's one you can keep pumping quarters into and it will let you continue exactly where you were. Um, because when you get to the final level, you then go up against every boss you've gone against all over again, one at a time, one after another. You get a boss, you kill it. You get a boss, you kill it. Um, and then there's the the bonus levels where the little flying thing from Never Ending Story comes along. <laughs> Balcor. <laughs> the Balcor <laughs> comes along and you jump on it and you get to it just destroys everything in its past. So it was kind of a those those bonus levels were a chance for you to kind of take a breather because Space Harrier, as it goes higher and higher, you are just constantly having to run and gun yeah. and moving all over the place. Oh, yeah. It's definitely seizure-inducing. <laughs> yes. And just like Afterburner, it had a stand-up and a sit-down yes. as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so great game. Yes. I, I honestly preferred the stand-up version of Space Harrier and the sit-down version of Afterburner. And I think because it was a guy. The next game in your list, Dragon's Lair. So Dragon's Lair and its counterpart, Space Ace... Which was infinitely harder. Uh, infinitely harder. Um, were two. They they were they were they were so groundbreaking in that they u- they were the first games to use laser disc for running the game. So you basically you are going to have to go a a, a linear path to the end. Now you could have different levels that come back that you play again and they're it, but 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 it is a very linear path you can't go off the beaten path you're going to play the story and for dragon's lair you're trying to rescue princess daphne if i daphne, remember right yes uh who's been taken by the dragon so you're going to go through the various levels where you're going to fight a black knight or you're going to you're going to ride on a whore, on a on a basically a ghost horse that has no legs or go through the uh the rivers uh, have to uh, fight against little ghoulish clay things. I don't know what they were, but it's hard. It's so hard. The game was damn hard. And it tells you how to play it, too, oh, while yeah. you're playing. Oh, yeah. It, it has a little flashing light that basically says, go here or draw sword or do this. But if you don't do it exactly on time, you will fail. <laughs> And the thing that was wild about Dragon's Lair is when you failed was the gruesome things that happened to the character. He would he would get electrocuted, he would uh all of his skin would melt off, he would <laughs> drown, uh he would choke to death, he would get bashed over the head. I mean, it was really oh it was a gruesome little Yes little it thing. was. And, and 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 not to downplay it, uh, Princess Daphne, 
Yeah, that's that's probably the first time I've ever seen anime porn. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, both her and the and the, the 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 girl in Space Ace too. Yes, same thing, same thing. Uh, the Don Bluth uh, group designed both of these games and did most of the animation for it. So basically, they wrote out a little piece of animation and they basically pasted it into this laser disc game. Yeah. This game is expensive too to play. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, cuz cuz uh, unless you knew all the patterns by heart, mm-hmm. you're going to be pumping quarters in this yeah. thing. Well, and I want to say it was 50 or 75 cents to play at the uh, to begin with. Yeah. Now, the two main games in the series are considered gaming classics that are frequently re-released for each new generation of consoles. In 2010, they were bundled alongside their unrelated 1984 Bluth Group game called Space Ace in something called the Dragon's Lair Trilogy. Now, apparently there was a second version of this game called Dragon's Lair 2 yeah. Time Warp. Yeah. I don't think I ever played this. I played Time Warp. Was it was it as hard uh, or harder? I I, it was harder. I don't remember as much about Time Warp because it wasn't the success that Dragon's Lair was. Yeah. And Space Ace wasn't even the success that Dragon's yeah. Lair was. But Dragon's Lair 2 Spa- Time Warp, yeah. I think you can get all three on your phone. Yeah. I know I've had Dragon's Lair on my phone. And it's just as hard. Yes. Uh, there was a Sega Genesis version that was nothing like the game, and it is insanely difficult to play. Insanely, and, and not not fun. So I don't think it did very well, but it was, it, it, the designs were nice. So yeah, uh, players have uh, five controls. You got up, down, left, right, and attack. Gameplay consists of reaching to on-screen button prompts with triggering pre-dawn success or failure animations. And it's a forerunner to the modern quick time event. A uh, perfect run with no deaths. No deaths last no more than twelve minutes. Yeah. Uh, the game has twenty-two minutes or fifty thousand frames of animated footage, including individual death scenes and game over screens. <laughs> Jeffrey's next game was Star Wars. We talked about that one. Yep. His next game after that was Tron. We talked about that one. His next game after that was Gauntlet Two. We talked about that one. His next game after that is X-Men. So X-Men was a great, great game. So, I mean, it was a a side, I don't know if you call it side rail, but you went from side to side yes. on the screen. And you. the cool thing was you got to, some machines forced you to take a character, other machines you could pick which character, mm-hmm. but you couldn't duplicate. No. So you couldn't have two storms and two Cy- two cyclops and two mm-hmm. wolverines. But that's the thing: you had storm, cyclops, wolverine. I believe dazzler, nightcrawler, nightcrawler, and and colossus mm-hmm. were the six characters you could play. Um, and then you you went along battling battling basically minions, and then at the end of every level there was a, a boss that you would have to get through, and it's just the graphics for the time were oh, yeah. just phenomenal. And not only did you have your standard fighting powers, but then you had your mutant power that you could activate. And like Storm would just throw a whirlwind out there. Yes. Cyclops, his laser blast. Um, Colossus, his, his strength. Wolverine, I think, went into his berserker rage. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it was just a really, really cool, cool looking game. And I know for a fact it's listed on the top 100 of best video games ever. I think it's oh, yeah. maybe in the top 10. Yeah. Oh, it was a great game. I can't believe I didn't think about this for my Cap- list. Capcom? Capcom, yep. yes. Uh, because there was a version where you could, that they combined the two, where you could fight your your uh, X-Men people against a Capcom game later on. Yeah, it was X-Men versus Street Fighter. Yeah, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Magneto kidnaps Professor X and Kitty Pride, prompting the heroes to go on a rescue mission. Uh, what was great about this is it was a double screen game. Yes. Yeah. So it was a really big side scroller. Yeah. Um, and oh my God, the animation in it was so beautiful. Just, you know, and and then you would come up against uh, super villains like Pyro, the Blob, Wendigo, Nimrod, the White Queen, Juggernaut, and Mystique. And ultimately you go to Magneto's base on Asteroid M where the final battle takes place. I've never seen it get that far. Now, we I've gotten there. Have you really? Yeah, I've been all the way through it. Oh, wow. <clears throat> I used to play with friends in college, and we would play, and I always grab Nightcrawler because I like Nightcrawler. It's a quarter pumper. Yeah, it is a quarter pumper. Um, I always liked Storm. I loved her whirl, her whirlwind yeah. power, the tornado that she would throw yeah. out there. Dude, I had a buddy 
I can't even remember who it was. He would play Cyclops. And that dude was so good at Cyclops. I think, I think Keith and I got all the way to the end. I'm almost positive of that. Jeffrey's next game is Starblade, which we've talked about. Uh, Jeffrey's next game is a 1986 game called Bubble Bobble. So Bubble Bobble is without a doubt a favorite of Keith's and mine. Yeah. There was a Mr. M's convenience store <laughs> very near the dealership that we worked at, and it had a Bubble Bobble in it. And oh, this is when you guys were grown. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, d- I didn't even remember this game when we were kids. But when we found this game at this Mr. M's, oh, my gosh. So it's it's in the same same kind of thing as like Donkey Kong where you've got – or uh, not, not Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers. Yeah. Where you've got two characters that are playing at the same time. And you've got all these things you can jump on because you're trying to kill all the creatures on the screen and move on to the next level. Well, you're these little dragons – and they don't blow fire, they blow bubbles. <laughs> and you use the bubbles to trap the villains, the bad, the little baddies, and when they're in the bubble, then you can hit them and kill them. Uh, you can also use the bubbles to jump up on top of them, go up higher on levels. There's different uh, different little, little things you can get, almost like in the Pac-Man where you get the cherries and the, yeah. the fruit and everything. There's different things you can get. Bubble, bubble, and the music. The music is really what does it for Bubble Wobble. And I know, and, and this is another one I know is in the top 100 of all time video games mm-hmm. because I don't know that there's an end to it. I think it goes forever. And, and, and the music is just, it's hypnotic is what it is. And Keith and I had so much fun. Playing <laughs> just playing Bubble Wobble. So, so much fun. <laughs> Running yes. up to the Mr. M store, playing Bubble Bobble. Yes. We would spend our lunch hour playing Bubble Bobble. <laughs> I think it's a Tato. Yeah, it is Tato. Uh, it was distributed in the United States by Romstar. I'm not familiar with that company. And in Europe by Electrocoin. I've heard of Electrocoin before. Uh, you, you, the players control Bub and Bob. <laughs> um, and it was designed by Fukio MJT Mitsu, Mitsuji when he joined Taito in 1986. And he felt that Taito's game output was of mediocre quality and in response to decades to make the the game was uh, fun to play and could rejuvenate the company's presence of industry. So Mitsuji hoped the game would appeal to women, specifically couples that visited arcades as such. So he decided to make Bubble Bobble so couples could play together. That's interesting. Or best friends. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, Keith's a couple with me. So, yeah. you know, Barbara knows this. It's yes, all right. right on. Yeah. Yeah. Green Gr- Gr- knows the same thing about you and I. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, Bubble Bobble became one of Taito's biggest arcade successes. I did not know this because I don't really I knew remember it was a this huge game. success. Yeah. Well, and that's the funny thing that as I read about it, um, that it talked about the huge success and being in the top 100. But I just I'm with you. I didn't remember seeing yeah. it before I found it at that Mr. M's. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking you know I remember Mr. Do, which was sure. not nearly oh, yeah. as big no of a game as Bubble Bobble was no, and it was released you know about the same time. It's it's like what. Why do I not remember this game? But now that you mention it, I remember playing the little dragons with the bubbles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I just... And the music is very hypnotic. Yes. And you would think with a name like Bubble Bobble, it would be something <laughs> I remember. In the game's plot, Baron Von Blubba is, uh, has kidnapped the brothers Bubby and Bobby's girlfriends and turned the bro- brothers into bubble dragons. <laughs> Bub and Bob. Bub and Bob have to finish a hundred levels. Oh, the so there is an end. Okay. Monsters in order to rescue them. Um, in the 100th and final level, players face a boss. This was one of the first games to feature multiple endings. Completing level 100 in single-player mode reveals a message stating that the game has not truly ended and a hint to the player, come here with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> if two players complete the game, they see a happy end in which the brothers are transformed into their human selves and reunited with their girlfriends. Wow, I did not know that. Uh, the ending also includes a code that when deciphered allows the game to be played in the faster and more difficult super mode. If the game is completed with two players, a second happy ending is, is displayed in which super drunk, the defeated boss is revealed to be the brother's parents under the c- control of some outside influence. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I remember these games having kind of long levels, a hundred levels. Yeah. I think you'd have to be there all day. You would. Maybe multiple days. Yeah, I don't think I, I know for, we never made it to the end because this is this is the first time hearing about that end. Yeah, yeah. So Jeffrey's next game, and it, 
This game did not make it into my list because I have not played it very often. I only knew of two places that had it. One of them was in Oklahoma. So, <laughs> um, Star Trek Strategic Operations Simulator. Yes. So another vector vector graphics, just yes. like Star Trek and The Empire Strikes Back. But in this one, you my I, I know there was a stand up, but the most common was the sit down yes. version. And you sat down in this cockpit, and you had a dial, mm -hmm. and you had phasers and photons. Yes. Yeah, you know? I think you had some buttons on the side, too, didn't you? Yeah, that's your phasers and your photons over to the side. Oh, actually, I think you had... Um, you had warp, so you could actually you could actually hit warp to go faster. Um, but but you, but you basically it was a simulation, and you heard and Spock was the narrator of the game as you went through. You would warp into an area. You would there would be Klingons around, and you're just you're flying around because there was because I do believe you had to thrust. You used thrust, phasers, photons, and then I think there was warp. So maybe there was four buttons. God, it's been so long since I've seen this game. You turn the dial to turn the ship around, and you mm -hmm. fired at the at the Klingons. There were also star bases you could dock at, which would um, regenerate your shields for you. Because as you got fired on, you would lose shields. Mm -hmm. It was a it was just a great great game. Yes, and you're right. You didn't see it very many places. I don't think it was very successful. Star Wars was the more successful of yeah. that type of video game. Yes. Uh, it, uh and it, oh my god, the Star Trek game was beautiful, and and the the music well, the vector graphics. I mean, yeah, how much beauty you're going to get in vector graphics? Yeah, you, but you just have to appreciate them. If if you go back and watch the um, the movie, let's say the movies like the Search for Spock or or the Voyage Home, when they're looking into the consoles of those Klingon, this is what you see. This what, is what you see. Yes. And it is exactly they, what it looks like and that's on their screen. That's why I loved it because what you were seeing in the video game is what they saw on their screen in the TV show and the movie. I, yeah. Phenomenal. It was, it, yeah, it was amazing. It, again, vector graphics, but that's what they were using in the movies. Right. And, and the sit down version, um, I know there's not much to it because it's actually two pieces with a, with a middle piece over it. Yeah. But for some reason, the way they had it designed, you didn't hear anything when you were sitting in it other than what was in the game. Right. Um, so it was, it was almost completely inclusive, even though there was a big hole in the side. I, I don't know how they did that. It had to be, you know, the placement of the speakers, the volume levels, you know, maybe some sound baffling. You know, I come, don't know. Come to think of it. And I don't know if this was a requirement of the game or whatnot, but I don't think I ever saw, Cause, cause it actually had two holes on it. Yeah. So you could get out both sides. Yeah. But big every ones. time I ever saw it, it was up against a wall. So you could only get in one side. Uh, I'm wondering if that was a requirement of the game. Oh yeah. Maybe they said you had to put it up against a wall to help with the sound baffling. Maybe. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I'm going to say the only two places I've ever seen it was up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you could only get in on the left side from where you were sitting. I think in. so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That never makes sense. About it. Yeah. Yeah, because it was it was very immersive. Oh my god, it was so pretty too. Um, that was a burping dog. Nice. Did we get that? <laughs> yeah, I'm nice. pretty sure we did. Yeah, that was that was Thor burping. Nice. Yeah, big burper. Um, Star Trek, uh, the original Star Trek television program and movie series uh, is what this was based on. It was released by Sega in 1983. I did not know that. Uh, of course, they used color vector graphics. For both 2D display and a 3D first person perspective. I Oh, mm -hmm. that's right, because you had the where you were. Yep. Because it also gave you a little dial of where you were in space, yep. like with a map on it. Um the player controls a Starship Enterprise and must defend sectors from invading Klingon ships. And they were all D twelves. Is that right? Klingon D twelves? Battle cruisers? I don't remember seeing a bird of prey in there. Yeah, they were They were not bird of praise. They were yeah. they were they were the Klingons from the series. So, yeah, the, the Klingon destroyers. So yeah, it could have been the D twelves. Yeah, the game was manufactured in two styles of cabinets: the upright, and again, I don't think I've ever seen the upright. I have. It's not as fun. It, so you've actually played the upright? Oh yeah. Oh nice. Yeah. You, you you sit in it on your left. You had the dial, mm -hmm. and on the right you had the four buttons i think yeah. it was and it was i mean it was some, you had to be pretty dexterous to do because you would you would have to thrust and then fire so you'd have to mm -hmm. know where all the buttons are yeah it was kind of almost like a predecessor to the current game controllers yeah. where you've got all the different buttons you got to know where they are Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, and the uh, and the dial was weighted too, so it had some heft to it when you moved it. Yes. So it did give you some resistance. Uh, yeah, it, it is four buttons: impulse engines, warp engines, phasers, and photon torpedoes. Hey, I got it. You were you were dead on, sir. <laughs> and it was also the chair kind of uh, looked like the motion pictures bridge chair. Yes. Um, which was pretty cool. Now it was ported to the Commodore 64, TI 99, 4A, the Atari 8 bit family, Atari 5200, Atari 2600, Vic 20, ColecoVision, and Apple II. I played it on the 2600 as well. The only plug in game I had for my Vic 20 was this game. And I didn't play it very often because the controls were too difficult on the Vic 20. They had it on the Vec trucks too. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did I tell you at the National Video Game Museum there's a Vectrex? Can you play it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We need to we need to go up there okay. and play, play that. All right. Let's, yeah. Let's let's do that. Some. Gee, twist my arm. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <sure. laughs> yes. Maybe maybe we could do a remote someday. That'd be cool. That'd be kind of cool. Um. So yeah, that is Star Trek, and I believe that takes us to the end of our lists. A lot of a lot of good memories with those because, mm-hmm. like I said, I spent. I my summers I spent a lot of time in the arcades and whether I had money or not I would go but you know it, generally I would be able to, to scrounge some quarters together and go up and play for a while but I I could spend an afternoon just yeah. walking around an arcade whether I was playing or not yeah um yeah and you get that now the kids are watching the stuff it's like man it kind of reminds me of the arcade sure I like the arcade better because there is more of a social aspect to it right uh, or an in person I did get to aspect. know some people at yeah. the arcades too I mean granted I mean you know think about it to, if when thinking about it as an adult that was actually kind of a little dangerous yeah but yeah because there were older kids usually sometimes yeah so but but all those games I mean fallen really 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 good memories yeah good memories yep yeah. Yep, and you know, and some of them were designed to be collected, like the X Men game. I played with my friends in college. I, the uh, the Gauntlet game. I played with uh, uh, some friends up at the skating rink, and we would we would bring quarters just to play that game. We had at the Mister M's across the street from Keith's place. There was a Gauntlet, Zevius, a Zevius, and something else. There was there was three. And then right next door to that, Mr. Holmes was Mazio's Pizza, oh, which yeah. had an arcade of its own. Yes, it did. And that had, at any, at one time, it had Space Harrier, Afterburner, um, as well as a whole bunch of other different stuff. Right but those are the two ones that I really, really remember from that. So, good nice. times. Good times. Good times. It was fun to grow up in the 80s. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm kind of glad that, that arcades are kind of making a comeback. You know, because they, they went away for a while. Yeah. But now it's it's like and, and they're mostly catering to us. But sure. I take my kids to places like this so they can experience what what I experienced. Sure, and they love it. Right on. All right. Well, then with that memory in check, thank uh, you, sir. We'll step over to the murdery side of the house. Murder for today's uh, today's story. Uh, I took information off Wikipedia. All that's interesting. Uh, Indie Star. The Journal and Courier, Delphi Murders, The Story of Abby and Libby, Fox News, Wish TV 8, and The U.S. Sun. And as I said a minute ago, this is the story of the Delphi Murders. Are you familiar with this at all? I am not familiar with this at all. It's not very long ago at all. Um, It's actually become pretty pretty famous. Uh, Delphi is in the Delphi, Delphi, Indiana. Okay. Delphi, Indiana. Okay. Yeah, that's why they call them the Delphi Murders. Um, the story is really about two teenage best friends. It was Liberty Libby German. She was age 13. And Abigail Abby Williams. She was age 14. Um, on February 13th, 2017, they'd been given a day off school. You know, like we had the snow days and whatnot. Yeah. They had a day off school. And they decided what they wanted to do is they wanted to spend the day hiking through uh, the historic wooded trails uh, on the east side of Delphi, Indiana. Lots of people did this. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was really beautiful. They wanted to go out, take pictures for their social media, so on and so forth. Um, Abby and Libby, they'd been best friends since middle school. They both played sports together. And touch my heart, they love true crime. So, you know, had to love that. Um, so Abby and Libby were dropped off at 1.35 p.m. Uh, by Libby's older sister, Kelsey. <laughs> I have one of those. You do have a Kelsey. 
uh, on County Road 300 North, which was east of the Hoosier Heartland Highway. So that's kind of gives you a visual of where this is at. Uh, the girls were scheduled to be pick, picked up at a prearranged spot uh, by Libby's father at 3.15 p.m. So is this something the girls did often or? they Yes. Okay. Yes, they did go out to out, out hiking here and taking pictures. They were really big on posting to social, social media as they went along. At 2.07 p.m., the girls were hiking on the Monon High Bridge over Deer Creek, and they posted a photo on, on, uh, Abby, or on Libby's Snapchat of Abby walking on the bridge. Um, and then the girls saw that they were not alone on the bridge. So there was a picture of a man. At 3.15 p.m., uh, Abby's father was waiting for the girls, but they never showed. Uh, he waited for the girls, tried to call them, but he couldn't get any reply. So then he started searching for the girls. When he couldn't find them, he called the family and said, hey, you got to come out here and help me search. I can't. The girls are not here. I can't get them on the phone. When the family came out, they couldn't find anybody. The police were called at 5.30 p.m. So they were dropped off at 1.35, 5.30 p.m., the police, the police are now out. So, and we're they talking, were good. They were good at two something. Is that correct? Yes, they were good at two oh seven when they sent the Snapchat. Okay. Um. So, police and other volunteers were called in to search the girls, but there was no luck. And once it got dark, they had to call it off. They said, "We just can't do this search anymore." Um. The girl, both the girls' parents were messaging everyone they knew on social media trying to find them. Uh, the next day, on February fourteenth, the search continued. And around noon during uh, during this massive search, two bodies were found. They were found about a half mile east of the bridge. Uh, at the time, police did not confirm the identities of the bodies, but they did suspect foul play. Um, and there was an autopsy performed, but details of how the girls were killed have never been released. So we have no idea. Well, the police uh, uh, presumably have an idea. Yes, they've just never released to the public the the manner of death. Uh, the next day on February 15th, police did confirm that the bodies were those of Abby and Libby. Uh, police announced they were investigating the case as a double homicide, and they released a grainy picture of a man on the Monon Bridge from the day the girls disappeared. So this was the picture that they took that they put on Snapchat. Uh, a few days later, they would call the man a suspect in the murders. Uh, the picture showed a Caucasian male with hands in pocket walking on the bridge head down towards the girls. On February 22nd, uh, police held a press conference in which they revealed that Libby recorded video and audio from her cell phone of who the police said was a suspect. I thought this was really cool. So this kind of goes into the whole true crime because I read I read or heard somewhere that the girls were interested in getting into CSI or getting into the FBI or something like that because they loved their true crime. Libby knew something was wrong, obviously, because she took video and pictures of this man that they didn't even know. Um, and they, um, they played the audio multiple times on the press conference in the, in the hopes that someone would recognize the voice. And what you heard in this first, uh, this first release is a man saying down the hill, down the hill. They played it over and over and over again. Uh, Indiana police, uh, state police, Sergeant Tony Slocum said of the clue that, uh, that, that Libby left behind, uh, this this young lady is a hero, there is no doubt. To have enough presence of mind to activate that video system on her cell phone to record what we believe is criminal behavior that's about to occur. And that's what I was talking about, really just the, the presence of mind to do that. Smart enough to roll tape, just exactly. in case. Exactly. Uh, police did also indicate that additional evidence from the phone had been secured, but they did not release it as they did not want to compromise any future trial. Uh, there was a reward of... Smart. Oh, Absolutely. And then there was a reward of 41000 that's offered in tips that led to an arrest. By the end of the week, police had received nearly 10,000 tips. There was a search warrant that was served at a nearby property, but no arrests were made. Uh, nor was it released why the search was done in the first place, but they were, they were saying it was part of the case at first. By March 9th, there were 25 local, state, and federal agencies all involved in the case, and the reward got increased to two hundred thousand dollars for any information uh, to, to to leading them to a suspect. On May seventh, a group of Delphi congregations they uh, organized a community trail day with a hundred people walking the Monon Monon Bridge High Bridge uh, Trail. The girls hiked the day they were killed. 
the Reverend Todd Ladd of the Delphi United Methodist Church said, the reality is that evil happened here, so we want to reclaim this ground. On July 17th, Indiana State Police released a composite sketch of the suspect. So this is from the video. Uh, They had a portrait that was drawn by an FBI sketch artist, and it was based on what police described as recent information from a witness who saw the suspect about the time of the girl's death. So we've got a witness that's come forward. Somebody else on the trail who saw the guy, saw yeah. the girls. Saw, saw the guy coming towards the girls or something like that. Um, it had been drawn uh, from eyewitnesses to a certain hiker of the Delphi Historic Trails on the day the girls had vanished. So other people that basically said, yeah, the guy in the video, we think we saw this guy. Here's what we saw. Uh, so the police did give a description of the suspect uh, the, as they had it. And he was a a white male between five foot six and five foot ten, weighing one hundred and eighty to two hundred pounds, with reddish brown hair and an unknown eye color. Uh, he was also described as wearing blue jeans, a blue jacket, or a coat and a hoodie. On July nineteenth, police asked am- amateur sleuths to stop posting photos of men who look like the man in the sketch. <laughs> so, is it this guy? Is it this guy? Yeah. Is it this guy? Apparently, they were getting a lot of them, and it was causing people some trouble. Right on. Um, the the Captain Dave Burson of the Indiana State P- Police Chief Public Information Officer, he said, they're placing themselves in legal jeopardy, and they are doing absolutely nothing to help the investigation. Um, so, he, he did plea with the public, please stop this. If you only only give it if you're if this is credible. Um, on September seventeenth, a man named Daniel Nations was arrested in Colorado for making threats on the on a trail. He's called a person of interest in the Delphi murders. Uh, Nations, who is a registered sex offender from Indiana, was arrested in Woodland Park, Colorado, and charged with threatening strangers on a monument trail with a hatchet. The expired Indiana plates on the car Nations was driving was noticed by police, who subsequently discovered an outstanding warrant under his name. Uh, Fanning public speculation still further, it's reported that a bicyclist had been fatally shot on the same trail around the same time that Nations was purportedly terrifying passerbys. Uh, an El Paso County, co- I didn't know there was an El Paso County, Colorado. That that, that one tripped me up several oh, times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, An El Paso County, Colorado sheriff spokesman told the reporters that however many similarities there were between the cases, he was not at liberty to disclose them since Indiana investigators did not want any more information released. They're still keeping everything very, very close to the vest. On January 5th. They want to get this guy. They want to get him right. Right. On January 5th, 2018, Nations was sentenced to three to years of probation for threatening members of the public in Colorado. However, he was not released since he had an active warrant on him back in Indiana. Um, he was transferred to Indiana on January 24th uh, on an unrelated charge, failure to register as a sex offender. And then in February 2018, authorities said that Nations was no longer considered an active person of interest in the Delphi murders. So he must have had an alibi for yep. the date. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Bruce, who formerly worked as a pastor, is charged with fatally shooting one woman and sexually assaulting two others after having ordered them at gunpoint into the back room of a suburban St. Louis shop for religious religious supplies. Uh, This was committed in broad daylight on November 19th, 2018, and these uh, crimes put Bruce in the spotlight of the press. Some noted that his being of similar stature, stature... Five foot seven to five foot nine, uh, to the then current sus- suspect description of the Delphi slangs. He also wore a flat cap and a navy blue jacket during this attack, not unlike the suspect. Uh, Indiana State Police did look into his possible connection in November, uh, and on, no- on de- December 4th, Bruce was charged with no fewer than 17 felony counts related to the St. Louis case and could receive the death penalty, but there's been no new information on Bruce and the connections to the Delphi murder. On February 14th, 2017, the families of Abby and Libby appeared on the Dr. Phil show to tell the girl's story. Police end up getting another 140 tips after this. Gotta love that. Nice. There was a Charles Eldritch that was arrested on January 8th, 2019 in Union City, Indiana on charges of child molestation and child solicitation. Uh, police in Randolph County alerted the FBI to a potential link between Eldritch and the Delphi murders on account of his strong resemblance to the suspect's suspect sketch. 
This was, however, before the updated composite had been released in 2019. So we got a new sketch, and this guy didn't match anymore. On April 19th, 2019, Indiana State well, Police... So far, so far, this uh, this investigation has got three bad dudes off the street. So regardless, if, if nothing else, yes. It, it, regardless of anything else that happens from this point on, three bad dudes are no sure. longer preying on women. That's a great point. Yeah. Great point. I didn't even think about that one. On April 19th, 2019, Indiana State Police announced a new direction in the case. On behalf of the state police and the multi-agency task force, Superintendent Doug Carter released more materials a few days later in a press conference held on April 22nd. The new materials included a short video recording from Abby's phone in which the blue jean and jacketed suspect is seen walking along the rail bridge for a little over a second. In the extended version of the audio, a slight rise in the suspect's voice can be heard when he utters the word guys before the phrase down the hill. So they've only released basically four words that this person has said, but it, it all came from Abby's cell phone. Uh, Superintendent Carter states that because of the ter- deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not watching, walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. So originally they thought maybe his gait would be indicative of the of the suspect, but they're saying now that it's the, it's the ties itself. Yeah, you got to walk kind of funny to, so you don't slip through them, yep. break an ankle. Uh, it was here that police released the updated suspect uh, sketch of the suspect saying he was in his mid-20s to mid-30s based on the new evidence taken from Libby's phone. Uh, Superintendent Carter says police believe the suspect is either from Delphi, was from Delphi, or worked in Delphi. It was further explained that the previously released sketch showing an older man with a goatee and a cap is now considered secondary. In the new sketch, the clean-shaven individual of the newly revised composite is now considered the primary uh, sketch of the suspect. Investigators did reveal during a press conference that they have reason to believe that the suspect might be hiding in plain sight, possibly even in the room where he was having the press conference. That creeped me out oh. thinking about that because he's basically he, he basically said that the person is almost certainly familiar with Delphi, uh, whether it could be working or living, uh, living or working there or could be in this very room. Could be in this very room right it, now. That just creeped me out. Uh, police were also looking for information about a vehicle that was found abandoned on Carroll County 300 North near the Hoosier Heartland Highway on February 13th, 2019. Police did not release a description of the vehicle. On July 23rd, 2019, there was a new person of interest. Paul Etter uh, was wanted for the kidnapping and rape of a 26-year-old woman on June 22nd in Tippin, Tippin, Tipp, Tippecanoe County. Wow, that one was a hard one. Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe. Uh, five days later, Edder was surrounded by police, and after a five-hour standoff, he died by suicide. I have no word on if he was cleared, but since the case remains open, I'm guessing he, he was ruled out. Well, okay, that's that's four guys off the street. We're about to get a fifth. Okay. In April 2021, a man in Lafayette, Indiana, was arrested for the kidnapping and sexual assault of a nine-year-old girl. This was 42-year-old James Bryan Chadwell. Chadwell had lured the, lured the girl into his apartment with a dog. I thought this was just awful. Once inside his home, Chadwell allegedly beat, sexually assaulted, and locked the girl in the basement. He even had his dog attack the girl. Um, police actually interrupted the assault by knocking on Chadwell's door and ended up finding the girl being held in Chadwell's basement. I thought this guy was awfully damn bold. Police are at the door, and he allowed him to just come in and search the house knowing that she was locked in the basement. Sociopaths think they're smarter than everybody else. True. You Very know, true. they always think they're smarter than everybody else. <sighs> well, good thing is on December 16th, 2021, Chadwell received 90 years in prison for this crime. Five guys off the street due to this investigation. I'm loving it. So to tie it back, there were pictures that were released of Chadwell and Indiana residents quickly pointed out that he resembled the first sketch released by police. Okay. Not the second one. Okay. Um, on February, on April 27th, 2021, Indiana state police named Chadwell as a new person of interest in the Delphi murders. That's as far as we have with information on him. 
On as of July 2021, Carroll County imposed a total blackout on releasing any information about possible persons of interest in the investigation. Uh, and this was according to Carroll County Sheriff Toby Lazenby. Uh, the community is banded together on this case uh, to honor them. Family members initially thought about raising money for new bleachers or a scoreboard at the softball field where the girls played. Their idea did end up growing into the LNA Park Foundation, which was a nonprofit created to oversee the construction of a $1 million park, including three ball fields, an amphitheater, and playgrounds. Uh, construction began in the spring of 2019 on the 20-acre Abbey and Libby Memorial Park, and donations are still being accepted. Uh, the NBA All-Star 2021 Host Committee also announced in February 2020 that it would re award a 50000 All-Star Legacy grant to the foundation to help in the construction of the complex. Pretty cool there. Um, Libby's grandfather, Mike Patty, has spoken publicly to the media about the toll the case has taken on their lives. Patty said in an interview in February 2018 uh, that he was still optimistic that there would be a break in the case. Finding the killer, he said, would allow his family and Abby's mother, Anna, to finally start to grieve. He further said, this is what you wake up with every day. It's the last thought before you go to bed. And some nights I don't sleep. For three months, I didn't sleep. Ouch. Uh, that sounds awful. I know. Kelsey German had said she considered her younger sister Libby to be her best friend. Finding their killer has become a calling for her. In February 2020, on the third anniversary of the murders, Kelsey posted this message to her 14,000 plus Twitter followers uh, at Liberty G underscore sister. Quote, Today, three years ago, was my last real day with my best friend, and I wish I could have done it differently. I miss you. Pretty sad. The Carroll County Sheriff's Department, the Delphi Police Department, the Indiana State Police, and even the FBI uh, have all taken part in a handful of no news conferences over the year, including one held about a week after the body was found. Um, they had no news conferences scheduled for this year, 2021. Uh, instead, the state police sent out a short news release on February 1st, saying only that a multi-jurisdictional team of officers is continuing to work on the case every day. The news release also read, We continue to actively investigate all tips and leads we receive by phone and email. This type of violent crime cannot and will not go unanswered. This is all the information that will be released at this time. Um, there's also been an augmented reality smartphone app called Crime Door. I saw this one. This was very interesting. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a video based on evidence from the crime and it allows you to get a close up view of computer Im generated images of the girls where they stood on Monon Bridge, Monon High Bridge, as the killer slowly approaches them across the abandoned weather beaten trails, uh, trail rest, rail trestle. That was really interesting to watch because you could you could see it from their vantage point where he was. It was all very 3D and really, really cool. Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, Kelsey praised the app. Uh, quote, this is an app that is going to help so many people and change the perspective of crime and hopefully solve cases and get arrest for many unsolved cases. Yeah, not just this one, but other ones nope. as well. Yeah. So here's the recent updates. On December 6, 2021, Indiana police have been investigating a fake social media account they are saying is linked to the unsolved murder. They uncovered an online profile named Anthony underscore shots, which was used from 2016 to 2017 on social media apps like Snapchat and Instagram. This fake account used images of a real male model and portrayed him himself as being extremely wealthy. Um, he would use this information to solicit underage girls for news, nude photos and get their addresses and would attempt to meet them. Photos used in the account uh, and shared by police show an array of luxury items the account owner supposedly purchased, including Gucci attire and a sports car. A 27-year-old man named Keegan Klein is allegedly connected to the account but has not been named a suspect in the case. He was arrested this year in December on third or in 2021 in December on 30 felony charges that include child porn and child solicitation. He's admitting to getting getting more than 100 sexual pictures and videos of teenage girls using the Anthony underscore shots profile. There's six guys this investigation has taken out. Well, police said they've identified the man in the photo, but he is not a person of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, police are continuing to investigate, but Klein has not been charged in the murders. So okay. it's another one that is off the street. To date, more than 50,000 tips have come to police, and every single one of the leads has been followed. Police believe they just need one more piece of the puzzle to solve this case. Superintendent Carter uh, said, quote, 
Somebody out there knows who this person is. I don't think there's multiple pieces of the puzzle. I think there's one piece, and it's having one individual with the strength to say, that's my brother, that's my dad, or mm-hmm. that's my cousin, that's my neighbor, my coworker. And I think we're one piece away, one piece, end quote. Um, possibly DNA was recovered at the scene that could help as well. Uh, police may soon be allowed to collect DNA samples from anyone accused, not only convicted of a felony in the state. So this is law that's before, I think the Supreme court now, uh, lawmakers are continuing to debate the laws, uh, where people could be used to, uh, submit DNA if they are simply accused of a felony. See a good and bad in that because, well, okay. You, if you get arrested, you get printed, right? Correct. They take your fingerprints. Why couldn't they take a DNA? Swab? Well, but this is very. This is saying simply accused. I, I, I'm not seeing if it means there has to be an arrest because there's really kind of debate. This is a serious violation of Fourth Amendment rights. Because can I, as Joe, police officer, come to you and go? Um, I think you committed a felony today. Give me a cheek swab. It doesn't say you have to be arrested. It says simply accused of a felony. Oh, okay. So uh, I don't. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. I, I see where that could be a sticking point. However, if I am innocent of a crime, and I and I am a righteous thinking individual, my first thought is, well, yeah. Why don't you eliminate me as a suspect? And here you go. So you can take me off the list. So you can look at other people. And then the devil's advocate side. What if it's DNA? that's found at a scene of someone you know. That's true, because my DNA is on people I know. Yeah, so here's the better tip, kids. They ask you for a DNA sample, ask for a lawyer. Yeah. Always lawyer up. If Uh you're being accused of something, lawyer up. Currently, all 50 states allow DNA samples to be recovered for convicted felons. Okay. These laws will be simply if you're accused. I think there's an issue here. Okay. So, yeah, so I would... My recommendation is lawyer up. Lawyer up. Because you you never know what you're going to fall into. And 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 there have been people who have been wrongfully accused because they said the wrong thing without lawyers present. Just lawyer up. Um this could though help broaden the search for Abby and Libby's killer if they if they're able to get some DNA. So Investigators are still seeking information, and they ask that people uh, who reach out to them provide any key details such as name, age, phone number, and why the caller thinks the person may be connected to the case. Such tips can be made anonymously, and there is a significant reward for information leading to the rest of the case, the 200000 that we talked about. Anyone with such information is urged to call the Delphi Homicide Tip Line at 844 844- Four five nine five seven eight six. Tips may also be emailed to Abby and Libby Tip at c a c o s h r f dot com. Uh, if you see something, say something. Please, yes. Police are asking anyone who interacted with the account Anthony underscore shots to contact law enforcement at either Abby and Libby Tip at c a c o s h r f dot com or seven six five eight two two three five three five. Uh, police need to know what social media apps were used and if Anthony underscore shots attempted to meet with you or get your address. Please also attach any saved images or conversations to the email. And that's the end of my story for today. But I'm going to try something new today. Okie dokie. We always end with the dark. Uh huh. And I'm going to try something maybe to lighten things up a little bit. Okie dokie. So what I'm going to do, you know, just... And it was something not as dark. So what I decided I'm going to do to leave on a more positive note, what I'm going to try, and we'll see how well this works out, see if we get our feedback. Um, I went and found other events that happened on February 13th. Oh, okay. To make the day a little brighter instead of the horrific tragedy we discussed earlier today. So these are things that happened on February 13th, various years. Uh, following the Glorious Revolution, William and Mary were crowned king, king and queen in, eight, in 1689. Yes, they were. Grant Wood, the painter for American Gothic, was born in 1891. Nice. Uh, Bruno Hauptmann was convicted in 1935 of the kidnapping and murder of the Lindbergh baby. Uh, NFL wide receiver Randy Moss was born in 1977. Yeah, Randy I like, Moss. I like Randy Moss. Uh, American singer and writer Henry Rollins was born in 1961. Go, Henry! American pilot Chuck Yeager was born in 1923. Chuck Yeager had a rocket in his pocket. <laughs> My brother was born in 1984. We love you, Kyle. 
And finally, what I think is probably the greatest event on a February 13th. In 1950, the great Peter Gabriel was born. Kyle, you don't rate as high as Peter Gabriel. <laughs> well, You did that on purpose. Nobody does. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that helps people get a little bit more lighter. Mm-hmm. I, I, I hope this works. I didn't know if it was hokey, but I kind of just wanted to try something a little different. I kind of like it. Maybe Good. we should do it for the next episode. Uh, I already have it noted out. Sweet. <laughs> I'm going to at least try it for three episodes, and we'll see how it goes from there. Sweet! So so that's the end of, of mine. Anything else you want to cover today? Uh, no, I think that's uh, I think we got it. Great. Thanks for staying along with me on that one. Uh, I think that's an important case to get out there, uh, and hopefully people will be able to give more tips, because I'm hoping either they have their guy, mm-hmm. or they're soon going to have their guy, since this is an unsolved murder. So... That'll take us to the end of our recording week. We appreciate everybody for joining us today. Please remember, as always, as we said at the beginning of the show, if you can leave uh, ratings on and reviews on iTunes, it's completely free, and it's something you can do to help us. Uh, we want to make sure that you go to our website, nerderymurderer.com. You can find links to what we talked about in the show as well as pictures. You can also find our merchandise there. So if you want your Nerder and Murder merchandise, you can purchase it there. We also have the link to our patrons, so if you wish to uh, donate to keep our show going, we very, very much appreciate it. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. There are some bonus things you get for being a patron, including uh, starting soon, we are going to have bonus content that is going to be available only to patrons. So we will have shows that you can only get if you're a patron. So think about that if you would like that bonus material. Please and thank you. Uh, You can find the link to our social media on our website as well as our email. So if you'd like to give us feedback, let us know things that you want to hear. We definitely accept all uh, all messages and feedback. Yes, we we, we like to get better and we like new material. Yes, we do. Something that we haven't thought of. Right. So with that, I have been... I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I've been Jeffrey with your murdery. Cue the music.